Club, and I welcome you all. Those of you here at the Governor Hotel, and those of you listening on OPB radio or watching on cable television. We're glad you're here with us for our program today on this Friday, the 12th of September, 2008. Our program today features a presentation by a national expert on landscapes who will help us understand Portland's role in launching a revolution in urban spaces in the US in the 1960s due to three fountain plazas built at that time uh, in our South Auditorium Urban Renewal District that were designed by landscape Al uh, architect Charles Al Halperin. Before we begin our program, however, a few announcements. First, in consideration of those sitting close to you and our radio and television audiences, we ask that everyone in the room silence your cell phones and other devices that have the potential to make noise. City Club has great partners in presenting these Friday forums, uh, especially our Friday Forum corporate sponsors, uh, without whose generous financial support, none of these luncheons would be possible. This quarter's Friday Forum corporate sponsors are West Coast Bank, the law firm of Stoll Rees LLP, Neil Kelly Company, and City Center Parking. We thank them all for their support. Uh, and I'm particularly pleased to have in our audience today Greg Goodman, president of corp and corporate sponsor City Center Parking. Uh, Greg, I think you're here. Uh, if you are, please stand up and we thank you for your commitment to City Club. Thank you. I also want to acknowledge and thank the Portland landscape architecture firm, Mayor Reed, uh, for its generous financial contribution that made possible the appearance of our speaker here today. Uh, I believe that Carol Mayor Reed and Michael Reed are with us along with others from the Mayor Reed firm and I'd like them to stand so we can thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now we all certainly know that this is general election season and next week's Friday Forum program will feature the first of many election related events held by City Club. Here next week, City Club will host a debate between candidates Amanda Fritz and Charles Lewis. Charles Lewis, who are running for Portland City Council seat number one, that's the seat being vacated by Mayor-elect Sam Adams. On September 26th, we will host a debate between the candidates for state treasurer, Democrat Ben Westland and Republican Alan Alley. And then on October 3rd, our Friday Forum will feature a debate on ballot measures 57 and 61, which relate to drug treatment and prison sentencing. Now also, if you have not heard, uh, be aware that U.S. Senator Gordon Smith's campaign informed City Club on Tuesday of this week that the Senator will not be participating in a debate with his opponent, State Representative Jack, Jeff Merkley, here at City Club this fall. The club has been waiting for over a month to hear from Senator Smith's campaign, and we offered uh, multiple dates, but he has declined. Now, I know the Friday Forum Committee worked hard on this, and I know the committee and our board uh, regrets the Senator's decision. Uh, we find it uh, disappointing and regretful because uh, it's contrary to our mission, uh, but it is what it is. And because Representative Merkley has accepted the club's invitation, we're going to follow longstanding club policy and tradition, and we'll proceed with the Friday Forum program without Senator Smith, uh, thus featuring Representative Merkley alone, and that'll be on Friday, October 17th, right here. City Club's political debates uh, typically sell out fast, so be sure to visit the club's website or call the club's offices to make your reservations, and watch the upcoming City Club bulletins for details regarding all of the club's election-related programs and ballot measure reports and resolutions that will be forthcoming. Uh, you do not want to miss the many opportunities to participate in the public dialogue and to become better informed, all offered to you by City Club this fall as these important election decisions that will impact us all will be made. And now to our program. And before I get into the introduction, I want to mention that our speaker will have a book signing at the back of the room immediately after our program today. So if you're particularly moved by what you hear and want to get a representation of it in a book form, he will be there to sign his books. Now in the 1960s, Portland helped launch a revolution in urban space with the construction of three fountain plazas designed by landscape architect Lawrence Halpern and Associates. These plazas were, and are, located in the South Auditorium blocks and they contain the Lovejoy Fountain, 
the Pettigrove Fountain, and the Forecourt Fountain. Now the Forecourt Fountain, which has since been renamed the Ira Keller Fountain, is the one located immediately across the street from the front of what we used to call Civic Auditorium, now called Keller Auditorium. These three fountain plazas merged water, landscape, sculpture, and urban design into a new and dramatic kind of public place. During a period when US cities were full of protest, Life Magazine in 1968 presented pictures of children and adults playing in Portland's Lovejoy Fountain. And just after the Kent State shootings and Portland's own violent anti-war protest in 1970, Forecourt Fountain, that's now Keller Fountain, had its public unveiling with what was described as a dancing, splashing party led by Halperin himself. And at that time, New York Times uh, architectural critic Ada Lewis Huxtable uh, dubbed the Forecourt Fountain Plaza, and I quote, one of the most important urban spaces since the Renaissance. This program today is part of a week-long series of events in Portland to celebrate Lawrence Halpern's plazas in our city and to kick off an effort to pre preserve them. The series is called City Dance and will culminate in a dance music performance at the Ira Keller Fountain this Sunday afternoon, September 14th. And we should be grateful, it seems to me, that City Dance is bringing attention to the Halpern Fountain Plazas in our city. Uh, as former Oregonian architectural writer Randy Gregg down here has uh, written, the plazas are by far Portland's most in internationally influential works of architecture. And yet I venture to say that most of us in Portland are oblivious to this fact. So our speaker today is going to help us with this. He will put Lawrence Halpern's fountain plazas here in Portland into the larger context of Halpern's work and into the context of what is called the modern movement of landscape architecture in America. And our speaker is highly qualified to do this. He is the president of the Cultural Landscape Foundation, TCLF, uh, a Washington DC organization that he founded in 2004. TCLF is the only nonprofit foundation in America dedicated to increasing the public's awareness of the importance and legacy of cultural landscapes. Our speaker served as a Loeb Fellow at Harvard's Graduate School of Design during the year he founded TCLF. And in that same year, 2004, he was awarded the Rome Prize in Historic Preservation and Conservation and spent the spring and summer of that year at the American Academy in Rome. This past fall, he was a visiting distinguished lecturer at Ohio State's Austin E. Knowlton School of Architecture and also was awarded the Alfred B. Lagasse Medal from the American Society of Landscape Architects, Architects which was given uh, in recognition of his 15 years of public service. Prior to forming the Cultural Landscape Foundation, our speaker spent 15 years as the coordinator of the National Park Service's Historic Landscape Initiative and before that, spent a decade in private practice focusing on landscape preservation and urban design. He is an award-winning author and editor on landscape architecture and cultural landscape topics, and has been a fellow of the American, landscape of, uh, uh, American Society of Landscape Architects since 1966. Uh, uh, he received uh, his BA in landscape architecture from the State University of New York in Syracuse. Now finally, he tells me that he became interested in what he ended up doing for a living at approximately age seven, when while gardening with his grandfather in Connecticut, he unearthed an old Moxie pop bottle. Now, Moxie, by the way, for those of you who don't know, which I did not, uh, is one of the oldest mass-produced soft drinks in the United States. It was created in 1876. It's still popular in parts of the Northeast, and I even found out it's the official soft drink of the state of Maine. <laughs> uh, in any event, our guest says he still has that Moxie bottle that he discovered in age seven and that he unearthed low those many years ago, and he credits that discovery with his inspiring his interest in cultural landscapes. He also tells me that he was a, when he was a practicing landscape architect in the 1980s in New York City, he wrote theater reviews and thus attended the theater in the city two to three times a week. Sounds like tough work if you can get it. And then finally, uh, he also confesses to be a, quote, hardcore fan, unquote, of the animated television series South Park. So while you're considering the implications of that last fact, please give a warm City Club of Portland welcome to our special guest, Charles Birnbaum.
I will not be quoting South Park today. <laughs> you know, before I begin, I'm sitting here with Ted Kay, and we were talking about other lectures that have happened here when they're controversial and they go beyond their half hour. And um, also, for me, I feel as if my hands are tied behind my back because being a landscape architect, it's like asking an art historian to talk about painting or sculpture without any visuals. We're blessed here in that probably everyone has been to the landscapes that we'll speak about today here in Portland, but you'll hopefully use your imagination for some of these places you haven't been to. Uh, one of the things Ted said to me, which really sort of struck a chord, um, is that this is not controversial. Now, what's interesting to me is Halpern has been controversial, not just in his lifetime, but in his legacy. In so many places, we have lost his landscapes, and it's been incredibly controversial. So I think it says a lot about Portlanders in terms of their ongoing discourse with the land. Um, it's almost um, Italian. Um, I was also telling Ted that when I was at the American Academy, I would say to Italians, you know, you guys have these landscapes in the 15th and 16th century, and they're still here. And a, a colleague, an Italian landscape scholar, said to me, oh, we're just too lazy to knock them down. <laughs> now, I don't know if that's really true, but it is fascinating to me that um, this landscape has endured. So with that, I'd like to um, give this paper now, which is really in two parts. The first is really um, a context statement, if you will, on the climate then and where we're going, and then a, really, I think, a call to action, and, um, and hopefully a harmonious call of a very wide net with people mo moving outside of silos, and I think that's what these next several days are, are truly about. And then finally, um, I'd like to dedicate this lecture to Anna and Larry who have been um, a spiritual force for so many of us, and we are really the recipients of the love that they have given us and the legacy that we pass through. Um, and finally, as Jim was mentioning, Life Magazine 1968, which I'm happy to say I just picked up on eBay for $12 last week in preparation for this lecture. And um, of course, it has this article, A Mid-City Mountain Stream. Uh, the short description that anchored the double-page spread noted the following, and I think in light of not having visuals, I couldn't ask for better words to open this lecture. Sliding over a rock lip, bumping and breaking as it cascades down hard steps into a pool, it might be a mountain stream in spate. Before he designed this fountain for Portland, Oregon, landscape architect Lawrence Halpern of San Francisco spent many summers studying and sketching moving water in the Sierras. The result of his obsession is more than a fountain. It is a piece of wilderness transplanted wet and dry, slithering and static, which effectively invites waiting and clamoring and contemplation. It was just two months earlier that Stanley Kubrick's A Space Odyssey opened, and I'm happy to say it opened in my neighborhood in Washington, D.C. at the Uptown Theater, while the same month, the issue of Progressive Architecture magazine featured the cover story, Portland's Plaza, It's Like Wow, <laughs> trumpeting Halpern's design. It's groovy, it sings, it screams, it whispers, I can touch them all, a 17-year-old hippie said. A visitor described as a 48-year-old lady tourist from California exclaimed, I came to the fountain just to see it. I put my toe in and I was lost. I had to walk up the steps, dress, nylons, who cares? What feeling, what freedom? One girl teeny bopper confided, I'm sort of scared of people, but here I can do my thing and I have to talk to someone. I can talk about the fountain. Sherry Voltz, a 24-year-old student, collected these recollections and gave them to Mr. Halpern with herself noting, I like to give presents, but I don't have any money. So I bring my friends to the fountain. It's nice to give something you can't buy. When was the last time in an architecture journal you read a description like that to describe a public space? Published on the eve of the annual meeting of the AIA here in Portland, the monthly trade noted that architects will come to the city and they will be able to see and experience the place that occasioned such effusions. It's a fountain, it's a plaza that has turned the hippie population of Portland and not just a few of its over 30 inhabitants, over 30 inhabitants, excuse me. They treat it as a public space should be treated, reveling in it, eating in it, making music in it resting in it, being loose and free in it, even getting married in it as a hippie couple did that past summer. How do we measure success today? Do we use the same criteria? The hippie subculture 
Unlike the button-down residents in the adjacent SOM design apartment building who physically looked down upon the new parks were lovers of psychedelic rock. They would have all reveled in Life magazine the previous month when the glossy weekly splashed across its cover the headline, The New Rock. The cover story also featured Janis Joplin, Frank Zappa, The Doors, and The Who. This was not just the dawning of the age of Aquarius, but here in Portland, unlike Halpern's concurrent urban work in Minneapolis and San Francisco, this highly animated and theatrical landscape represents both the initial courtship for Halpern's over 40 year romance with the American city, as well as his love for and abstraction of nature and his new rock, this one at the auditorium forecourt, where fountains and plazas are formed to link with nature's process, not copy her, as he had said. The design was unlike anything we'd seen before, and a national chorus followed. As Jim mentioned, Ada Louise Huxtable weighed in, the most important urban space since the Renaissance. Equally critical to this moment, let us not forget, as Jim also mentioned, this was a time of race riots were taking place throughout the US, with physical aggression aimed at neighborhood businesses, government representatives, and law enforcement agencies. In between the time that Petty Grove and Lovejoy parks opened between 66 and 70. Over 50 such riots took place across America. When the Kent State shootings occurred in May of that year, fresh in the country's mind during the Four Courts opening, the city fathers of Portland were well aware of the tension between, I'm sorry, the tense situation, both locally and nationally, and even here in Portland, it was going to be a hot time summer in the city. On June 23, 1970, when the Four Court opened, Larry's sketches published in his notebooks document the day, depicting what is easily 100 people immersed in the Four Court's cascading waters. As recounted in a 2003 interview we had at his office, Larry noted, well, the day it was open was hysterically exciting because what happened was, it was the 60s. All the young people from miles around appeared on that day and they started jumping into the fountains. As I say, they were designed to be used in that way, particularly participated in. If I remember correctly, it was the mayor who got very upset and tried to shoo them away. And therefore, I decided the best thing to do was not argue with the mayor, so I jumped in. <laughs> it was all very successful and very, very jolly, actually, and there was a lot of fun about it, and it really, excuse me, sorry about that. And it really did establish the notion that this was a different kind of park than the usual kind of park. The mayor subsided and the rest of the city became very attuned to it. They used to bring their children, they still bring their children, and people love it. Larry's always enjoyed abstracting nature in his work, as exemplified here in Portland, where steps echo the rocky ledges of the High Sierras, as with his most recent work at Golden Gate Park Stern, Stern Grove at Yosemite Valley, as well as um, Halpern's work at, um, I'm sorry, Stern Grove and Golden Gate Park and at Yosemite Valley, it is both Halpern's unique interpretation of nature and how humans interact with it that is his signature hallmark. What architect Charles Moore, his, his frequent collaborator and collaborator here, described as the power of the ideas and the unstoppable dynamics of his vision, a vision of humans experiencing with all of our senses a richly dynamic world. Yet to understand the origins of these ideas, one may go back about 60 years to 1948. Halpern was 32 at the time, and he was employed by the landscape architect Tommy Church. How many people here know the name Tommy Church? So now I have a sense of how many landscape architects are here. Well, it was at this time that Larry was working on the Donnell Garden in Sonoma, California. The panoramic hillside location overlooked the northern extensions of San Francisco. Bay. Completed later that year, the garden was immediately famous for its groundbreaking form, particularly the kidney-shaped swimming pool. The frequently photographed garden came to stand for a modern style of California living that took place both indoors and outdoors with a fluid transition between both spaces. What is most interesting in revisiting this project through the lens of Halpern's later urban projects is the shape of the pool inspired by abstracting nature, perhaps a natural spring or a watering hole and Adeline Kent's contemporary sculpture, which is both beautiful and functional, serving as an island that separates the swimming pool and the play areas. Um, a few years ago, I asked Larry to recount this project for us. There's always some questions in many of his projects of authorship, um, just as there has been here with his role with Angela, Dona Angela Donaggia. The same was the case for many years with the Donnell Garden in terms of his time with Tommy Church. He said, quote, 
What I can basically say, it's fair to say, is that my pencil drew it. The big difference in what you see here is that I originally thought that one of these rocks would be in the pool. And Tommy, I think, absolutely correct, said, no, Larry, that won't work because people will get hurt trying to get on it. And why don't we get Ken to do it, as Adeline was a good friend of his. I did have the basic idea that the pool should be L-shaped because it's much more interesting as a swimming experience, and that the sculpture should be at the hinge point, and that would make it possible to actually swim through it. It was very influenced, of course, by ARP and all of those artists. Now, whether this was directly related, it was absolutely subconscious. Anything that anybody says about it would be wrong in a sense that it was not a conscious thing. I was very interested then, as I have always been in all my life, in the innate natural stone as not only sculpture, but a thematic material to bring back everything to the earth symbolically. My art, from which my point of view is intuitive, it's not particularly intellectual. It depends a lot on myths and symbols and basic primitive ideas of what human beings are like, and the rest of it is beep, beep. Sorry, I know we're having a simulcast later. I didn't think I should say that, so. <laughs> Following the completion of the Donnell Garden and armed with a few years of residential design experience in 1949, Halpern would open his own San Francisco office. For those of you that are landscape architects, the names Gene Walton, Don Carter, Satoru Nishita, Richard Viggy Vignolo would all be in the office during the Portland work, along with Angela Dinaja and others. The same year, Halpern would also publish The Choreography of Gardens, an impulse dance magazine. Now, recognizing that the next several days here in Portland are intended to celebrate the city dance of Anna and Larry Halpern, I can't resist inciting this article written by Halpern just nine years into his marriage. Here Halpern wrote, our gardens have become more dynamic and should be designed with the moving person in mind. Our garden space has become a framework within which these activities of all sorts can take place. As a framework for movement activities, the garden, in, can, in, excuse me, the garden can influence our lives tremendously. At the conclusion of this article, Halpern puts forth an unfulfilled challenge. The art process must be total and continuing experience rather than compartmentalized into museums, theaters, or symphony concerts. If the kinesthetic sense is satisfied at a dance concert and left dormant during the week, we are only half alive. But if we can be cultivated and encouraged in our daily lives in garden and house and all of our environment by designing for constantly pleasant patterns, our lives can be given a continuous sense of dance. From the moment Halpern opened his office, he began to realize these ideals, exploring his design philosophy of what he would call choreography or choreographed for movement. This expression appears on the very first drawing that he does for Portland. He would then create a trapezoidal dance-shaped dance deck nestled into his and Anna's wooded hillside residence in Kenfield in 1955 and serving as a bridge to future expressions of what he would call solid, modern, non-organic forms, help him moved away from the biomorphic and kidney pool shapes of the past, and with his revolutionary design for the Bay Area McIntyre Garden in 1960, which tragically no longer survives. Over the next several years, his ideas of space being choreographed for movement, and the final recognition that, quote, participation and activity are essential factors in a city, finally made a great, glorious leap over the garden, garden wall. The turning point was here in Portland. In the eight block choreographed sequence, I would argue that still to this day, this mantra has never been as ambitiously realized by Halprin. Today, these parks and open spaces are cherished by many of all classes and their stewardship goals should aim high. Could this renaissance and renewal be as significant to the city and to Halprin's extant built legacy some 40 years later? I cannot help but think that there are absolutely parallel opportunities to what happened with New York and the Central Park Conservancy, except this time it would happen for a post-war work. To answer this question, and perhaps serving to guide Portlanders and the Halpern Landscape Conservancy to, as their mission statement says, activate, improve, and maintain this legacy, I would like to spend the remainder of my time suggesting a strategy for ongoing care and management of Halpern's work here in Portland. Now, well, not, well, much has happened in the preservation movement over the past several decades. Until recently, no surprise, the primary focus has been on architecture. You walk around the city, what do you see? Plaque decay. There are plaques on every single historic building, it's so it seems. You don't see a lot of plaques on landscapes. 
Now, when the National Register of Historic Places was created in 1966 with the passage of the National Historic Preservation Act, its mission was, this is going to sound like a governmental sentence, which it is, to work with the states and the general public to identify and preserve districts, sites, buildings, structures, and objects which are significant in American history and culture. Now, if we step back from this for a moment, there's 83,000 National Register properties in the U.S. There's about 2,600 National Historic Landmarks, or more elite group. Of that, we only have 1,900 landscapes with significance in landscape architecture, of which 190 were designed by the Olmsted firm, 10% publish or perish. And we have, of the 2,600 NHLs, we have somewhere between 50 and 60 that have significance in landscape architecture. We're looking at less than 2%. Now, if we think about it in terms of NHLs for landscapes, three of them are associated with architects' homes, Philip Johnson's Glass House in New Canaan, Connecticut, Manitoga the, the, um, in Garrison, New York, the Russell Wright property, and the Gropius House in Lincoln, Mass. All have significance in architecture and landscape architecture. The only four properties with NHLs in significance were all designed by Dan Kiley, three in Columbus, Indiana, and the Colorado Air Force Academy, none by Halperin. The landscapes that are actually designated here in Portland, some of these I'm, I'm assuming will be familiar to you, are the, the, um, the Lloyd Estate at Lewis and Clark College, or the Odell Manor. It was the first designation for landscape architecture in the area from 79. The Rocky Butte Scenic Drive, Historic District in 91. The Holden House in 99. One of my personally favored places, Laurelhurst Park, 2001. Misha's grading is just sublime. And Lynch House and Gardens 2002, and again, Misha's work at Mount Tabor Park in 2004. Count it, six designations. I did a perusal of the list for architecture. I stopped counting at 500. 500 buildings plus are designated in Portland, not to mention the 12 historic districts and all of the buildings that make those up. This is an astonishingly small number given the diversity of significant landscapes in the greater Portland area, but also the need to assign value as a way of preserving and interpreting this legacy for future generations. Now let's add the overlay of less than 50 years of age. The National Register has a bulletin with the sexy governmental title, National Register Bulletin Number 22, Guidelines for Evaluating and Nominating Properties that Have Achieved Significance Within the Last 50 Years. What it basically says is, you know, unless you're exceptionally significant and you're less than 50 years old, you really can't be designated. Now, what's interesting to me is that in 1999, we had one landscape designation less than 50 years, which was Tommy Church's work at the GM Technical Center in Warren, Michigan. Um, and as I've mentioned earlier, the other properties. But in terms of architecture, the situation is quite different. There are over 1,000 buildings that are less than 50 years old that are designated. And with the exception of the artist properties that I've mentioned and the, the four Kylie properties, that's it. Now, what can be done about this? What are the examples that we could do to change this? Well, first of all, let's look at a project parallel with the work in Portland, because in 1966, Marcel Breuer finished the Whitney Museum, which was designated some years ago. It was recognized as being of exceptional significance as the work of an internationally acclaimed master whose work had a profound influence on the course of American architecture and as a representative of the expressionist movement in modern architecture in the US in the 50s and 60s. Within this established approach, one could easily consider Halpern design landscapes during a parallel movement and nominate them with sufficient context. Now, although this may sound a little sad, I'm happy to say that there are signs that things are changing. This past spring, the Cultural Landscape Foundation, we were recognized as a formal consulting party for a proposed streetscape project that would have irreversibly altered a little known project by Lawrence Halperin. It's called Park Central Square in Springfield, Missouri. I'm pleased to report on May 22nd, the less, the less than sympathetic design proposal was not only thwarted, but the design was found eligible to the National Register of Historic Places, a first for Lawrence Halperin in the US. Couldn't the same criteria be applied to Halperin's concurrent and far more significant work here in Portland. Now, aside from nominating and designating these landscapes as a tool for protection, it's also worth recognizing that in recent years, the diversity of Halpern design landscapes have been threatened, destroyed, or significantly altered. This includes Halpern's pedestrian malls, such as Nicolette Mall 
in Minneapolis, shopping centers such as Old Orchard Shopping Center in Skokie, parks and open spaces such as Skyline Park in Denver, even museum grounds such as the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, which tragically was lost a few years ago, and was Halpern's really only true sculpture garden in the public realm, all of them now gone. In addition, today a number of Halpern's designs face an uncertain future, and as such will be subject to change that will almost certainly not be sympathetic. Current at-risk examples include Heritage Park in Fort Worth, Texas from 1976, Manhattan Square Park in Rochester, and the Charlottesville Mall also from 76. Even Halperin celebrated Sea Ranch. How many people here have been to Sea Ranch? Wow, great, I'm jealous. Uh, it's interesting to note that it was the, the, the main um, condominium complex was designated in 2005 under the themes of architecture and engineering. Halpern's landscape is invisible from that designation. Perhaps this is the reason why, as we speak here today, there's now proposals to put structures in the meadow. That somehow the open space that Halpern had designed as a setting for the lodge, for the condominium complex, will now be altered. And I ask all the landscape architects here, where is the outrage? There is no discourse about this happening whatsoever. This is absolutely an iconic landscape for Halpern in terms of his collaboration with Moore, Turnbull, Linden, and Whitaker. Now recognizing the dynamics of landscapes and our cityscapes where change is absolutely inevitable, one tool is at our disposal for documentation, the Historic American Landscapes Survey, HALS, whose mission is to record historic landscapes. Now the National Park Service oversees this in concert with the American Society of Landscape Architects and the Library of Congress. Since HAL was enacted in 2000, several post-war landscapes have been documented with cooperation from local ASLA chapters. Current examples where modern landscapes are being designated are the Kaiser Roof Garden in Oakland, California, the first modern roof garden west of the Mississippi, and PV Plaza, which actually was adjacent to Nicolette Mall, Halpern's design, by um, M. Paul Friedberg in Minneapolis. As I ask you to ponder such undertakings in Portland, it is worth noting that the very first modern landscape documented in America was in fact Halpern's design for Denver's Skyline Park. His 1973 design, like the chain of open spaces here, was also conceived as a catalyst to serve as a destination for downtown workers and visitors alike. The story of Skyline Park, its brief 30-year history, I say 30 because it was largely destroyed in 2003, bears witness to changing tastes in design and attitude towards public space. On the eve of its demolition and with support from a state grant, university faculty, excuse me, university students with faculty supervision documented the three-block landscape just weeks before its definition, de demolition. The effort was the first such project for a landscape in the country from the recent past, the first landscape documented in Colorado. They actually turned the fountains back on one last time. I went back to the university the next year and the students of landscape architecture at both the University of Colorado as well as Colorado State when they found out about this, they said they would have chained themselves to this had they known that this was going on. So at least it's been documented, it does serve as a model, but we are losing these landscapes. Now based on these other national examples and opportunities, I hope that you will agree that the Portland chain of open spaces can also be documented to house standards. The other good news here is that the narrative history that would be generated for house could also serve future NHL and National Register nominations. Now, the designation and documentation of a landscape are two ways to increase its status or stature, um, not to mention increasing its chance for state or federal support. And I say that because things like Save America's Treasures, Preserve America's, if you're an NHL, you get to check a box. It's a much more elite group. It's far more competitive for getting federal funds. The same with state funds. Um, but another way to instill value is to celebrate the legacy. In just the past few years in Seattle, for example, not only was there a centennial conference for Olmsted a few years ago, but on its 30th anniversary for Freeway Park in 2006, there was also a series of staged events, which really did turn around, I think, years of neglect and invisibility for that landscape. The events of this week, conceived in stage as a performance journey, are a powerful way to spotlight, celebrate, and interpret Portland's legacy. This quest is also echoed in Halpern's own ideas. In 2004, reflecting on how we can educate the public about their civic role in planning and protecting their physical environment, Halpern bemoaned that such undertakings can be heavy responsibility, but can also be an expansive one. Halpern also went on to note, we have good models to follow in the larger environmental movement. We can learn from them and interact with like-minded groups to bring attention to this need for thoughtful preservation of the best examples of what he called life-enhancing landscape art form. 
Here in Oregon, for example, the Oregon Environmental Council, how many people are members of the Oregon Environmental Council? So we have lots of people that could be bridge building for us. It celebrates its 40th anniversary this year. Since its inception, during the infancy of the modern environmental movement, the council staff and volunteers have worked across the state to advocate on behalf of all Oregonians. Their notable results have made Oregon a cleaner, healthier place for all and for future generations to come. At the core of Oregon's mission, of the council's mission, is the idea that we all have a shared stake in Oregon's future, and with that, a shared responsibility to protect it and do our best to make it better. Has the time come for environmental groups to become advocates and stakeholders for these more urban historic design landscapes? Might, how might the artists, designers, and historians who are involved in the city dance build bridges with the community and bring them into the fold? Now, everything that I have mentioned regarding outreach and education can also be considered through Larry's own words. In fact, we're extremely fortunate in the case of Halpern's legacy that he has been one of the most prolific authors, critics, and documenters of his own legacy. I would argue not since the writings of Frederick Law Olmsted and his surviving collections at the Olmsted National Historic Site and the Library of Congress has there been such a foundational record. A few years ago, I asked Larry to put in writing his ideas towards the preservation of modern landscapes and his own legacy. This was something that he really resisted doing. He wasn't comfortable with actually doing this. The um, publication in the back of the room has Larry's essay in there. I'll just read to you one thing he said. The quality and character of all cities is dependent on design. This includes the design of buildings and perhaps most important, the design of open space. These open spaces have been designed over time and all together are what we term landscape architecture. The best pieces of landscape art and design are important, not just as contemporary places to live in, but as part of our history and culture. We travel to iconic places all over the globe and use them as touchstones for our culture and our memories. The difficult question is not whether we should protect and preserve the best of the designs, but which ones are best? Which is worth preserving and why? Not everything from the immediate past is worthy of preservation. How do we decide which works deserve to be preserved in our cultural landscape? Fortunately, in the years ahead, in the case of Halpern's surviving legacy, we have the foundational knowledge to meet this challenge. Our task as both inheritors of this legacy and hopefully wise stewards is to guide and manage change by documenting, analyzing, preserving, and interpreting this legacy so that we may successfully answer this difficult challenge. Beyond today, with the Halpern Landscapes Conservancy at the helm, we can embrace the hierarchical relationship between designers and the public and continue to guide the future of this abstracted mid-city mountain stream through myriad civic artistic events and happenings. Instead of Anna Schulman Halperin as conductor, we too can work with facilitators in modern versions of what Larry would call the New England Town Meeting and the Old Indian powwow to integrate community participation workshops into the design process. All we need to do is embrace this manifest in his extraordinary built legacy, informed and inspired by his books, numerous articles, technical reports, and extensive office files and drawings housed at the University of Pennsylvania archives. For those of you that have never been to these archives, it is a religious experience. It is so well organized. I mean, Larry just gave them this stuff and it's just, you know, it's like an addiction every time I go there. It's like, oh, that was eight hours, that was quick. Um, the future, but I digress, the future of Halpern's legacy in Portland may be considered through the lens of a restructured design process that he himself pioneered, recognizing that landscape design requires, in Nagy's terms, vision in motion, and I imagine if Halpern were with us over the next several days for the lectures, dance performances, musical scores, that he too would ponder, translate, ruminate, marinate in all of this creative energy as a way to develop notational systems to reconsider the Portland chain of open spaces in the future and to use his words from 1993 with his work here, recapture the magic. Today, as I imagine each of us moving outside of our comfortable silos, landscape architect, dancer, hippie, cellist, coffee barista, I can't help but think that the city dance journey lends itself nicely to Halperin's diagrammatic language of motation. And I encourage each of you to consider writing your own score for the participatory events that will follow over the next several days as a way to document the journey, inspire the work that is ahead of us, and collectively celebrate our time over space. 
As I was in the airplane yesterday putting the finishing touches on this presentation, I found myself strangely looking out of the window at these cavernous western canyons while I was looking at the City Dance program. And I had the strangest memory, a short story from my high school years, The Horse Dealer's Daughter. I don't know if people remember this, the D.H. Lawrence story that he wrote in the 20s. The story uses symbols to illustrate our quest for happiness and love. You may recall that in this story, the heroine, Mabel, goes into the pond that represents the start of a new love, with the water symbolizing both baptism and rebirth. When she steps in, her troubles are washed away, and it's the start of a new life. Today, I imagine Larry jumping into the water of his canyon fountain with the mayor looking on in 1970 with hundreds of hippies getting all glibby glub gloopy, nibby nabby noopy, and I feel energized, inspired, awaken and reborn. Thank you. Our first question of our speaker as always will be from our board host. Our board host today is Ted Kay. Ted Kay is Vice President for Finance of Teledirect International, formerly Wygant, here in Portland. Ted has been a City Club member since 1990, He's been active in the club's research program, received the City Club President's Award this past spring, and he currently serves as our treasurer. Ted? Thank you. Uh, Charles, I'm going to ask you a partisan Portland question. Lawrence Halpern has been doing a lot of these landscapes over many years in his career. How do our three Halpern landscapes rank among his entire work? One of the things when I talk about landscapes is, is I like to talk about landscapes like Russian nesting dolls. That we have to understand how we stack up these places. It's what the National Register would call context. I think in terms of the National Park Service criteria we would say is significance, how important is it, and integrity. How is its condition? Does it still convey the original design intent. Well, in terms of the design intent, it's all still very much there. It's unquestionably there at a much higher degree than many others. In fact, I think part of it is because landscapes here, California, you guys are blessed. You know, concrete lives longer than 25 years. Um, back east, many of the landscapes you might have noticed that I suggested that are all lost are all places that have um, much harsher environments. I mean, all one has to do is look at the old theater houses to see anything that was an old theater house back east because of snow doesn't exist anymore, but here in California, you drive around, you see all the old movie houses. In the case of Halpern's design, unquestionably, this was pivotal in his career. It was pivotal for landscape architecture. Um, in the case of the classic text, and there was a whole table of landscape architects here, we all grew up with Norman Newton's design on the land. And projects like this, um, Newton would refer to uh, uh, Halpern and uh, Friedberg and others as being the inheritors of what Olmsted and Vox had started and that we were uh, reclaiming the city, what Halpern called the kaleidoscope of life. And so I think that in terms of the context of the sheer ambition, the integrity and the significance of this landscape, it is unquestionably, and it's so nice not being a federal employee anymore, I can actually say this and not get into trouble, but unquestionably this is a candidate for National Historic Landmark. This is the big mother doll, you know, and maybe this is the mother doll holding hands with the FDR Memorial mother doll, but nevertheless, they all fit within this. And the ideas that came out of Larry's office in this project and what it meant to cities across America, as Ada Louise Huxtable said, um, it was monumental and it still actually is. So I would refer to this as I often do as one of those, yes, I would fall on my sword for that landscape places. All right, now, City Club members, I see a, a, a microphone over there that normally has a line of people by it, and I don't see a line today, <clears throat> which seems ironic to me, because if there's any place in the United States that likes to uh, take pride in its public spaces, it seems like it's Portland, and I know there's a lot of people in this room are interested in that, so I encourage you to kind of crank up your uh, creativity and find your way to microphone to ask, ask questions. When you do ask a question, uh, it's a privilege of City Club membership to do so. Uh, please uh, limit your question to 30 seconds. Remember that a question is a, is a question and it's not a speech. And uh, 
Let's get creative and stand up, okay? B.J. Seymour, City Club member. About 10 years ago, um, I was at a lecture, and I don't recall who the lecturer was, um, but the speaker said, oh, the Keller Fountain wouldn't be built today. People would be too afraid that someone would fall or something, some liability would occur. Would you comment on that? Well, I think, unfortunately, that's probably the truth. Um, as we've seen in other cities, when there are accidents that happen, and I have to say yesterday when I was out there and I watched folks walking along the edges and I just thought, you know, it's just going to take one accident. And, and it's really scary because then there's the knee-jerk reaction like we saw in Fort Worth, Texas after um, the, the landscape which um, Philip Johnson referred to as his Larry Halperin design, um, which is, of course, the water gardens. It was closed for several years. Now, I'm happy to report that it's now been rehabilitated and they've dealt with some of those problems, but you know, it's the same for everything in our built environment. Think about playgrounds. I mean, Larry himself, Paul Friedberg, the, this was the era of adventure play and discovery. Um, today we, we open a catalog and we buy playgrounds and they come with their own liability insurance and that's why we like them and that's why municipalities like them. And so I think in, in everything in public space, we're, we're always aware of the legal issues and you know, you don't have to stop there. I mean, I always think about my time in Italy and I'd be walking on these escarpments and thinking, you know, one step and you're dead. And that was half the fun. <laughs> so I think that probably to some, ex to some extent, that is half the fun for people. And to put up railings and to limit um, that exposure, if you will, would really diminish that landscape experience. So I, for one, um, I would actually say that's character defining in the design, the fact that it is boundless, that you really can have, um, to quote a, an early 19th, 20th century landscape architect, uh, Stephen Hamblin, you can have a spiritual contact with nature in that landscape. Um, the challenge, of course, is, is what's appropriate. Uh, now, the flip side of that, I'm taking more than 30 seconds to answer this question, but I do want to make a point about the, um, the bike damage that's happening in the park on the earth works which over the long term is really going to be a problem. And on one hand, I, I sat there for about an hour yesterday watching the bikes go through there and the exuberance of these kids. And, you know, one thing that Larry would always say is he never wants to see, you know, don't go in the water, don't do this. I mean, he was very opposed to that. But over the long term, there's going to be degradation, there's going to be erosion, the tree community will ultimately demise. Um, the tree community is holding those landforms together right now. It's a whole set of dominoes. And so I think these are complicated questions that really require educational responses. And so whether it's sort of use good common sense when you're walking along the edge of a water body that's 15 feet off the ground, or it's repeatedly riding, riding a bike over and over again over a drumlin landform that's going to be eroded over time. So I think it's a stewardship and it's an education challenge. And to me, it's almost the equivalent of the guard in the museum. You know, you know the guard's there. It makes you realize you shouldn't be touching the paintings. And so perhaps there may be some stewardship opportunities here to instill value as a way rather than saying, don't do this and just be driven by liability concerns. Emily Gottfried, City Club member. I played in those fountains as a teenager and loved them and bring, your, still bring... That's why your skin is so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> and I still bring uh, guests to visit them all the time. The Lovejoy Fountain is kind of hidden um, people don't know it's there. Is, what do you have to say about that? <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. I, I was a little disoriented when I got to my hotel, which is two blocks away from the, the open space, maybe even less than that. I'm staying at the Modeno. I'm putting in a plug now for this new hotel. They have wonderful soap, by the way. Um, <laughs> I, w I, wa I wanted to just get oriented, and I just, looking at the map, I forgot where the chain of open spaces is. And of course, you know, I think one of the great challenges for the, the tourism office is how do you get these labeled on a map so people know that they're there, that they have an identity. Um, and I asked the guy that I was told was very knowledgeable who wanted to give me restaurant recommendations. He pointed to the map, and he pointed all the way to the northern end. I said all three parks by name, and the man who I was told was the man that knew everything at this hotel sent me completely in the, I mean, it was literally, all I had to do was turn to the left and it was a block away. And so there it is right under people's nose. Now, I would actually say that the example that I'd like to point to in response, because I do believe that with recognition comes value. 
And I mean, I know there are a lot of people that think like, well, let's keep it a secret. This way people won't come here. I, I say no to those people. I say um, open the doors and instill value. And the best example I can think of in the US is the city of Louisville. You go to Louisville, Kentucky, and you look at Main Street, and you have many, you have a vacant Mies van der Rohe building, you have the Humana building by Michael Graves, and if you ask Louisvillians to name a famous architect, they will tell you Olmsted. And they will say, and you know, there were three. All the parks have been branded, and the Louisville Olmsted Parks Conservancy has done an extraordinary job of branding what they have, giving it identity, giving it value. And I do think that it is a problem to go to these parks and see traditional park signage that says, yes, it's a park, we know that. There should be something that says, this is special. And it doesn't have to hit you over the head, and it should ideally be subordinate to the experience itself. But it should sort of, it should be announced, and it should um, have a way of letting people know that it's there and to be um, enjoyed and uh, celebrated. Club member. Um, in Portland, we, have a, we, we tend to equate civic space and art space pretty readily, but I feel like there's a disconnect between Keller Auditorium and the park, and I'm wondering if you could address that or maybe talk about what if we change the equation and instead of developing around the notion of real estate, we actually develop the real estate around something that we value like uh, Keller Fountain. Are we going to fantasy land now? <laughs> well, you know, in Portland, many, many things like that can happen. Well, I mean, I, I think it's, it, you know, as an idea, it's, I mean, I'm going back to uh, South Park and Imagination Land, which was the defining three-part installment this season. Um, this really is Imagination Land. I mean, I, I guess what I would, you know, it's funny, I, walk, I went back this morning to watch the sun come up, and I went through the spaces, and, um, and it was fabulous. But what I found myself actually focusing on this morning was all of the, the vacant real estate associated with the residential complexes. And, you know, th those spaces are the hinge point. It's the connective tissue to the way pe the people that are working and living in this community. And, you know, I think very often we start to look at these places and say, well, you know, Who's using this and why aren't certain people using it and other people have appropriated it? I think part of the problem right now is all of those economically viable pieces that are supposed to make these buildings and spaces function and have smooth landings are um, slightly broken. And so I would turn around and, and instead of sort of saying, well, let's turn this around, I, I, don't, I think it's very easy with public space to say, you know, economic cash revenue generating is bad. And I've done this myself. I talk about plop and drop, where we have to put in performing things, cafes and spray pools and sculpture gardens and, you know, this, this sort of mentality of fill it up. It's what I call poo-poo platters for the ADD generation. And, and so the question that you're asking is, is slightly loaded in that we're saying, well, if we let that drive the train, is that a bad thing? And I would say it doesn't have to be. That, I mean, think about the great spaces in Italy and they function because of all the commercial activity that's happening in a way that is part of the way people live their lives in those cities. And that's what's broken. You know, I mean, there's, yes, there's the hair salon, and I mean, I, mean, I, I would peek into these stores and people would look at me like, you know, I'm, I'm getting my tips frosted, why are you looking at me? But that's where it has to happen. We have to reconnect all of that. And I would say that the challenge is that we have these artificial boundaries. This is parks land. This is, you know, I think about what that quote from Impulse Dance magazine about our life only being half full. We have to get out of these silos. Yes, we can't let the economics drive the train, but you know what? Look at the, the construction that's happening. It is going to drive a lot of the trains. There's going to be a lot of cabooses pulling in a lot of different directions. And I think if you instill the value, you get people to know what this is, you give it a cachet, then everyone wants to have a part of it. So I would say turn the equation around, start with the great resource that you have, treasure it, promote it, renew it, and then guide what's going to happen. Think of it as a mini city. It's what Portland does so well. Do it here. Hi, my name is Sunil Bhatla. I'm new to Portland and a soon-to-be City Club member. Um, my question is a bit of a follow-up to your answer two questions ago when you 
recommended that, is that better? Um, you recommended that uh, we find a way to communicate the significance of what we have. Um, as a newcomer, is there a resource that you might recommend that I could use to go out and experience what we have and at the same time understand and appreciate the history and context that you're referring to also? That I don't think there's a one-stop shopping for that answer. I think one, like in many cities, has to cobble that sort of thing together. I will put in a cheap plug, however, and I didn't pay this man to ask this question. I want to confess that up front. Um, one of the, the question you've just posed, unfortunately, unless you're a handful of cities, um, it's very difficult to know what's out there. Um, one of the things the Cultural Landscape Foundation will be launching at our website at the end of this year is a national database project called What's Out There? And you will be able to type in the name of a landscape architect or landscape designer, a type of landscape with a data dictionary, and geographic locations, and if you will, build your own Rus Russian nesting dolls. Show me all the rural cemeteries. Show me everything by Larry Halprin. Show me everything by E.T. Meesh in the state of Oregon. Now, this won't happen overnight, and we're hopefully going to find a lot of support from uh, university programs. We have a lead gift from the Richard H. Driehaus Foundation. There'll be images that you can download free of charge. But I think that it will be used by preservationists for context. It'll be used by designers for inspiration. It will be used for residents and tourists to find out what's out there. And you know, when you think about it, I mean, here we have many people here from the dance world. Uh, there are similar databases for dance. Nothing like this exists for landscape. It exists for architecture, sculpture, painting, and dance. And our goal is to build a community, a hearth, if you will, where everyone can find out in the, in the landscape world what exists out there. Um, and I know for me, when I'm going somewhere, it's going to be great to just sort of be able to go to a database and say, tell me what I should go see. TCLF.org, sign up for our monthly e-letters. <laughs> Um, I'm also getting a sign here that I should put in my plug for the Halpern Landscapes Conservancy, which will be the local one-stop shopping. I know that we had, um, I don't know if everyone saw, there are these wonderful brochures that have just been generated for the chain of open spaces. Can you hold that up, please? Thank you. Very beautiful. And um, please pick one of these up on the way out. Tom Bennett, City Club member. Um, as an urban designer and resident of the neighborhood, um, I find the relationship of the architecture to the parks to be dubious at best. Um, what would your suggestions be in strengthening that relationship? And do you, in fact, agree that that relationship uh, would need to be strengthened? That's a really wonderful question. And I tend to actually not focus on the architecture very much when I'm there. I think of it as envelope. I think of it as sort of that mass space diagram where it's the black boxes. One of the things I've always been intrigued by, I have to say, is the integration of the parking. That to me has always been very interesting and exciting, the openness of actually parking your car and actually seeing what appears to be a park. So perhaps maybe the environment is better for vehicles than it is for residents, I couldn't say. But, um, you know, I did find myself looking up at the dappled light in the terraces this morning. Um, I, I wish I could answer your question. I haven't really looked at it closely enough. But what I will say, which I think is why this space has survived, I will look at it from the standpoint of access and egress. That as I walk around this place, one of the things is that there are multiple entry points. That there is this fluidity between both the residences and the businesses. And if you take a look at other places like Freeway, Freeway Park, which to me is the other NHL prospect is the first park over freeway in the US. What happened there, what happened at the Loring Greenway from the same period in Minneapolis is with flight from the city, the buildings that came in that were to fill in the teeth and the mouth, if you will, in other places turned their backs on the resources. And so what I would say, what is unique to Portland and to this legacy is that there is a fluidity. And, it, and like the parks, it needs to be renewed but what's wonderful is it exists there. And it, it, I think it's part of the reason why it does still have a, a life force in terms of how these spaces get activated today. I want to remind you that uh, our speaker will be in the back of the room after we adjourn for book signing. Uh, and I'd like to thank uh, Charles Bernbaum for his presentation here today, today and also for everything he's doing to help all of us Americans appreciate the value of our landscapes. 
And as we uh, adjourn, I think it's probably appropriate, I'd like to have everybody that's connected with City Dance stand up right now and uh, be recognized. Because it's a wonderful thing you're doing. And we are adjourned. Thank you.